He is just not moving, but he may be still registering and seeing. If you say this patient had an EEG hooked up to his brain in the emergency this room. This was part of a study. Yeah. Everybody that came in with cardiac problems was enrolled in this study, okay? So they now had the a thing setup. Is, is, now, the... you said that most, you're right, you're absolutely right. Most people that have MI do not get an EEG. You're absolutely correct. Um, where we get this information is from many individuals who undergo cardiac surgery, and one of the means to assess brain perfusion is to hook people up who are getting cardiac surgery with EEG. When arrest occurs in this condition, that is, why, that is where the information comes from. When we say that with cardiac arrest, within 10 to 20 seconds, there, the EEG becomes isoelectric. It becomes flat. That's where that information comes from, specifically with cardiac patients. Well, we have to argue with the literature because that's, no, that's no, no. you know. It takes, it takes a few minutes before the brain function goes down, not 10 seconds. It doesn't. Brain expert and neuropsychiatrist Dr. Peter Fennick teamed up with Dr. Panier to endeavor to find out what happens to the brain during a near-death experience. When you have a cardiac arrest, if you monitor brain waves or the electrical activity of the brain, you find that within eight seconds, it's almost absent. And it's absent throughout the brain, so you don't have little pockets of activity. So, to all intents and purposes, once the heart has stopped, the brain ceases to function. Now we know from our neuroscience that you cannot have experience without a functioning brain. So once the brain function has stopped, then all experience must stop. If it doesn't stop for any reason, then you, you've made a very strong statement, and that is that mind and brain are not the same. Hundreds of miles away in Holland, Pim van Lommel, a cardiologist at the Rheinstadter Hospital in Arnhem, was also using the same kind of control conditions in which to study near-death experiences in cardiac arrest patients. Dr. Van Lommel and his research team talked to over 300 cardiac arrest survivors within two days of their heart attack. They found that 41 of them reported having had one. One of the patients in Dr. Van Lommel's study was a man who had been found in a meadow having suffered a heart attack. He was brought to hospital where the medical team carried out extensive cardiopulmonary resuscitation, during which time he displayed all three signs of clinical death. His heart and breathing had stopped and his pupils dilated. When the patient was stabilized, he remained in a coma for one week. And after one week, he came back on the cardiac ward, and the nurse who was there during the resuscitation came in for the first time to give him medication, and the patient said, you were the one who was there when I was brought in. You were there when they brought me into the hospital. You took the dentures out of my mouth and put them on that cart. It had all these bottles on it. There was a sliding drawer underneath, and there you put my teeth. And the nurse was flabbergasted. He said, this is not possible. Possibly this patient was in deep coma, couldn't see anything. But the patient told him that he could see everything from above his body. And he could see the doctors and the nurses, what they'd done. So during the period of coma, he could perceive in a position out and above his body. Dr. Guy, will you please give your summary of the discussion? When looking at the overall effect of belief in the afterlife, uh, I would say emphatically that belief in the afterlife is beneficial and definitely better than not believing. Uh, essentially, in the last century, there were far more deaths and genocides at the hands of people who did not believe that humans have uh, uh, in, uh, value, that we have a spirit, that we have an afterlife, that we will be held accountable for our actions of man against man. People who don't have that uh, basically led the greatest genocides because of this idea that, you know, hey, you know, some people are better than others. Um, people who have had near-death experiences don't come back believing that they're better than others. In fact, this is a survey here. Uh, well, it's, it's a paper that was written about looking at, it's called the Life Change Inventory Questionnaire. And Pim Van Lommel and co-workers basically took a look at people who had near-death experiences two years uh, after their near-death experience and then eight years. And what they found 
was that the effect that the near-death had near-death experience had on people was very interesting. They be, they became more apt to show their feelings, to accept others, more loving, empathic. Uh, they they became more involved in attitude. Uh, they started they had a, developed a greater interest in their purpose in life, uh, interested in the meaning of life. These are individuals who become more social and involved in loving relationships and less likely to be involved in things that harm. A number of people who used to hunt stopped hunting because even, even their sensitivity to the, the, the life of animals goes up. It, it, when, when people have that experience and they, they walk into that light or they talk to that being, that, that light person, or they have that life review experience, they come back with the conclusion that people are valuable, that what matters most what really matters is love. The, the positive behaviors, the love that we demonstrate toward others is what lasts forever. It never ends. That is the most important thing that there is. When we work on our relationship with loving others and our relationship with God, that's what it's about. You never lose that. You take the knowledge you develop and you take the love that you've given and that's eternal. The only statement I agreed with you, Dr. Guy, in the entire discussion is that love is important. I'm in full agreement with you. That has nothing to do with soul, spirit, and God. It's love. I just said universal brotherhood. We're all one. We don't need gods. We don't need religion to recognize the universal brotherhood. And by the way, I have to disagree with your comment that atheists are responsible for that. Let me give you one biggest example. Religion has never guaranteed morality or goodness. In 21st century, we don't even have to go to history. Nothing guarantees No, 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 no. Nothing here, here. guarantees You know, that. the point is we must live in this one and only life to the best we can, because it's a valuable human experience. It's a great experience. We don't need to believe in an afterlife. That, as I said, for all practical purposes, and the available evidence says doesn't exist. I'm not even thinking about that. Life is so beautiful and so precious, and human experience is such a great experience. Let's enjoy this day, every day, to the best we can. I agree that we need to live our best lives now. We need to do, you know, do what we believe is right and 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 live, you know. So yeah. I'm not I'm not against that. I do think though that uh, people who have had the experience of have had the near death experience, and again, not all near death experiences are the same. Uh, but people who've, who've gone to that side and experience that light, if you will, they come back. Uh, percentage-wise, a large number of them believing in an afterlife. Um, not only that, they come away with the understanding that the past isn't ashes, that your life is a continuum. When you step outside of this space-time continuum, your life is one long, flat DVD, and it exists. It's you. It doesn't go away. It's, it's there forever. What you do matter. What you do matters for all time. Thank you both very much for uh, joining us on the Kohava Show. It's my pleasure. And I am your hostess, Kohava Latham, and we will see you again. Thank you for joining us.